Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And it really is about that heart relationship. So Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses. And this Holy Spirit comes to uh, help us to testify, to be uh, those who stand up for Jesus. So today's your chance. Uh, so who'd like to share a testimony of what Jesus means to you or has said to you or what you've experienced, what growth uh, you see uh, from this concentration on John 14, 15, and 16 and the idea of the branches and the vine. Who'd like to share? Someone with a good word for Jesus. I've really uh, enjoyed this series. I think that um, it came at the right time and uh, the right emphasis and so clearly presented. Um, I think that the twins, patience and hope, um, were a highlight of this. Um, if you know me, you know I'm not a very patient person. And uh, that's something um, I need to work on and give over to the Lord. Uh, he isn't finished with me yet, and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> um, this came at a good time, too, because... The world is in such a mess. Um, and it's easy to get discouraged and think you're on the wrong side of things. And it's, um, I think there, it's um, evident that there's a lot of evil in the world. and. The face of evil is not pretty. It's ugly. It's a monster from the pits of hell. And so you've got to have, you've got to have hope. You have to see above that and see the overarching power of God. And justice will be done. And it will be done by the Lord. Um, and um, we can do our part. All we can do is our part. And it's so important not to get distracted by other side issues, of which there are a lot right now, deception, and um, fix our hope in Jesus and the plan that God has, which thanks to him he has revealed to us we do know what it is so I want to thank these guys tremendously and like Gil says all the music and everything that just fits so beautifully someone else And uh, you were showing pictures up here of different bushes and trees and everything you've seen on your trip. And there was a little old bush that you thought was dead. I could sure feel for that bush. <laughs> <laughs> but you said it had a little life in it. And that's good because we need to have a life and tell what Jesus has done for us. And he's been good. And another thing I want to talk about, Gil, for just a minute if I can. What, talking about how important it is to plant a seed. I'd been praying for my oldest brother for a long, long time because I, I just I knew he wasn't saved. He never went to church. And I always said, Lord, don't let him die till I get up there to see him. And it happened to be that Gil and Louise was in Portland. Remember that, Gil? And Doyle was at an, uh, 
hospital there in Portland. And uh, I, I, Gil and, and Louise were just six miles from that hospital. And I asked Gil if he would go up and just talk to my brother. I had been sending him cards and everything. And, <clears throat> and I said, Doyle, when you and Ronnie get to heaven, you're both going to have really good legs and you're going to run all over the place. But anyway, you said you t went up and talked to him. And then I had the chance to go see Doyle, but he had, was clear out of it. His eyes were just glossy. There just was hardly anything left. And his wife said, go in and uh, tell him who you are. And uh, so I went in, and, and I said, Doyle, this is Bonnie. And he looked past me, and he said, did the little preacher come? Is that something? And it must have been Gil that he was in. <laughs> but anyway, he, Doyle was saved. I had the opportunity. The Lord let him wake up for about 45 minutes from out of nowhere. And he wanted to talk to me. And so I went in and I said, Doyle, can I talk to you before we pray? And he said, yes. And I asked him, I said, Do you, would you like to accept Jesus as your savior? And he said, yes, but I don't know how. So I just, we prayed the sinner's prayer. He repeated it right after me, word for word. He accepted Jesus. And it's so important, Gil, to plant the seed. Somebody plant the seed, and he was saved. Thank you. Oh, aren't we going to be glad to have Ken back? Who knows what he's doing? <laughs> this is good. This is good. If you take your Bible and turn to John 15, and if uh, you don't have a Bible with you, the pew Bible in front of you in the rack, turn to page uh, 1046. By now, I hope that uh, all of us can pretty much uh, quote this. <laughs> but let's hear it again one more time. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. <coughs> you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remember, you're already clean. It implies, it looks to us like when he says he cuts off every branch, what he really means is he cleans it and puts it up on the, on the uh, trellis, uh, ties it up. Abide in me. I will abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain or abide in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, 
that he lay down his life for his friend, friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now, you remember that this is what Jesus told his disciples on the way from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prays not my will, but thine be done, and goes on to the cross. We've called this the second part of the last lecture of Jesus because it is the last words that he says to them before he goes to the cross. He's telling them about what their relationship with him will be after he leaves them. In John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, he prays not just for the disciples themselves, but also for those who would believe in their message. Wouldn't you say that's us too? That all of this applies to us, to each and every one of us. He's teaching us how to live as his followers, how to be his disciples, how to live in a heart relationship with him, how important that is, how we are to live and what our life is really all about. In John chapter 10, Jesus says that there is a thief. We have an enemy, and his purpose is to kill steal and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, or some version, have it more abundantly. The TV preachers have uh, hijacked uh, that verse and turned it into, you can have a Cadillac and uh, be healthy for the rest of your life and uh, live a life of ease and luxury. But obviously that's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus is giving us a life to live that is more abundant, that is more full than the life that we lead in this world. In the first part of the last lecture, Jesus said these words, believe me, When I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. We don't know what to do with those verses, do we? What did he mean? What could he possibly have meant? In a physical world, it makes no sense at all. But in a spiritual world, it makes perfect sense. Pick some examples. Jesus changed the water into wine. How are you doing trying to do that? Do you really think Jesus intended for all his followers to be able to have instant wine whenever? No, I don't think so. Jesus walked on water, and what a great experience Peter had uh, doing the same thing. But... Is it really the intent of Jesus that his followers be able to walk on water and be hard on the boat industry? No, I don't think so. It doesn't really change the world. Jesus healed the sick. But they all got sick again and eventually died. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead.
but he died again. When you think about it, Jesus died on the cross with 11 disciples. Well, he gained another one on the cross, didn't he? The thief. A few women. A few other hangers on. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit whom Jesus had promised came upon the disciples and Peter Peter preached a sermon and 3,000 people believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and will spend eternity in heaven. You'll do what I've been doing and greater than this. Lives transformed. Lives lived in the power of the present Holy Spirit of Christ, changing a world in ways that Jesus in a physical form never could do. Look at the church today. In my lifetime, when I was a child, continents were barely touched around the world. Now the Church of Jesus Christ is a prominent present, presence in every continent on earth. We heard the miraculous story at the GLOW event earlier in the summer that there's half a million Christians in Iran of all places. God is at work through his people. And how is this happening? How, how does this take place? In the book of Revelation, we're told plainly how it takes place. It takes place because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Jesus did his part. He died upon the cross for our sin in obedience to his Father. And we do our part as we share the life of Christ who lives in us with all those around us as we witness, as we testify, as we live lives that demonstrate that we are connected to the vine. And the Holy Spirit is at work in us. Jesus said that whoever has faith in him would do what he's been doing. Immediately our thoughts go to the miracles, to the teaching, to what? And we miss, so totally miss, the most important thing. And Jesus tried to tell us in the last verse of chapter 14. He says the world must know that I love the Father and I only do what he tells me to do. You will do what I've been doing, he says, by your faith in me. What is it he's been doing? He's been not living his own life, but living the life the Father gave him to live. He's been living a life of obedience to his Father. And we will do the same. connected to the vine, receiving the words of Jesus, loving him with everything in us, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And as we love him, we obey him. We do what he tells us to do. You are my friends if you do whatever I ask, whatever I command. Jesus tells us he has sent his spirit to live in us, to remind us of everything Jesus taught us. It is the spirit of Jesus living us in us that is doing his work in us. It's exactly what Jesus said. The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. 
and today across the world, across Idaho, Meridian, and yes, Meridian Friends Church. Are people who are living the life that Jesus has given you to live because it is Jesus in you who is living his life. And as he lives his life, we are fruitful. And this is to the Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples, as he said. Remember back earlier in the summer when we talked about fruit, we said that fruit is anything and everything that's different about you because Jesus has changed your life. Because you're no longer living your own life, but you're living the life he's living in you. <clears throat> fruit. We know that fruit comes in a lot of different ways, but we're all familiar with the fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, as I read these, think about our world today. We think about the thoughts we thought already today. Does the world need this? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things, there's no law. Who would want to make a law against any of these? We, we need these. <clears throat> Those who belong to Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. The fruits of the spirits are naturally produced. They're produced because the branch is attached to the vine and getting all its nutrients, everything it needs from the vine. And the vine dresser, the father, is caring for the plant, for the vines, for the branches. The father is tending you, caring for you pruning, cleaning, instructing, guiding. The Father is at work in you, and fruit is produced. The fruits of the Spirit don't come because we have a class, or because we have a sermon, or because we say, let's all pick one of these things and work on it. Janice, you take patience. So we'll each take one that we struggle with and let's just work really hard on that. The fruits of the Spirit are not produced because the branch tries harder. The fruits of the Spirit are produced because the branch abides. The branch stays connected. The branch receives the words of Jesus and those words abide in us to guide us to direct our lives. No, Phil really got it right today. It's about the heart. Change our heart, oh God. If we're not changed on the inside by the abiding in Jesus, Nothing we do on the outside will last or make any difference. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus made it clear, made it plain. So here we are at the end of the growing season. Uh, well, the sermon series anyway. We're so excited to have Ken and Teresa back and everything I hear from them is they are really excited to be coming back. Uh, they have so much to share. They've had a wonderful and life-changing sabbatical. 
and uh, we're really happy uh, for them. Uh, they've experienced so much, and they've grown so much. They've learned. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, their growing season is not over. And maybe you didn't want to hear this, but neither is ours. <clears throat> For the rest of our lives, as followers of Jesus Christ, this is profound, basic, foundational truth to our life in Christ. The ongoing questions that we will ask ourselves for the rest of our lives are so simple and so basic. Are you abiding in the vine? How are you doing that? Are you listening for the words of Jesus? Every day, give us today our daily bread. Are you producing fruit? Is the fruit of the Spirit in you? Jesus said the world must know that he loved the Father and only did what the Father commanded him. And what's our testimony? Can we say that we love Jesus and only do what he tells us to do? Are his words remaining in us? Are we putting them into practice? Are we seeing his cleansing and lifting and his training, his dis discipline in our lives? Are we being pruned for more fruitfulness? The vine dressers at work. Are you asking? Jesus said it over and over again. Ask. Ask. Only this time, let's not ask for the Cadillac. Let's ask for the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask for the transformation of heart and mind. Let us ask for the fruits of the Spirit. Is your joy in Him complete? I love it that he promised joy. And why did he promise joy? Because, because joy comes when, for Jesus, his joy came when he obeyed the Father. Hebrews chapter 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. There was joy in obeying his Father, in doing what his Father asked him to do. Hard, yes. In agony, he prayed, I don't want to do this, but your will, not mine. But the joy of enduring the cross was in obeying his Father. And he wants our joy to be complete. And our joy is complete when we too obey what Jesus has taught us. When we do what he asks, of us. Today is the last day of the journal pages, and the scripture for today is so profoundly fitting. From Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. There is a light growing in each of us. The light of Christ's presence. Jesus, who says, I am the light of the world, shines in us, and as we yield to him, as we live for him, we see that light shining brighter and brighter to the full light of day. Oh, clear back on the Sermon on the Mount. What did Jesus say? So, let your light 
so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus, I am the vine. You are the branches. Abide in me. He invites us. And then he promises us, I will abide in you. Will you pray with me? Lord, how accurate your word is to us. How profound is the teaching that your word is living and active and able to penetrate to the deepest places in us. Lord, thank you today for your word. As you gave it to us in these three chapters of John that we've studied this summer. Lord, may we often be drawn back again to these words. To remind us of these things that are so basic, so foundational to our life with you. We feel it's so important, Lord, that we not finish this series and go on to something else, but that we take this with us for the rest of our lives, using it, applying it, living it in every part of our lives and all that we are and everything we do. And for that, we need the work of your Holy Spirit, and so we invite and ask, Father, for the Holy Spirit, the the Counselor, the Comforter, the Helper, who guides our lives and teaches us all truth. Lord, we need you today. We bless you, Lord, for what you've taught us this summer. We bring now to you an offering, Lord, and ask again that you would receive what we bring and bless it and multiply it and use it, Lord, for the needs of ministry, that your name might be lifted up in this place and beyond. How good you are to us. We love you. In your holy name, Lord, we pray these things. Amen. Will our ushers come, please? for our offerings. 